Today's guest, the author of The Atheist Muslim, A Journey from Religion to Reason, his writings on the topics of secularism, jihadism, and rationality have appeared in CNN, the Huffington Post, and plenty others, and he himself has appeared on The Sad Truth, The Joe Rogan Experience, and many other podcasts. He also co-hosts his own podcast, The Secular Jihadist, and as if all this wasn't enough, the guy is also a trained physician. Today, I talk with Ali A. Rizwi about his time growing up in insular liberal bubbles in Libya, Saudi Arabia, and Pakistan, specifically his times bootlegging old copies of Bertrand Russell books in uh, Lahore, Pakistan, uh, as well as the reverse culture shock of moving to Toronto, Canada, where he currently lives with his daughter. Ali A. Rizwi is a fascinating human being, and although he wouldn't say it, his life is very much marked by bravery. Uh, his book, for instance, has made it impossible for him to return to any of those three places I just mentioned for fear of being killed. He receives hate mail regularly based on his writings on secularism and jihadism. I really, really enjoyed this conversation. He's a fascinating person. It brought me a lot of joy. I hope it does for you, too. Enjoy. This is Baggage Claim, travel stories no one tells. I'm Will Conway. If you're enjoying Baggage Claim, subscribe. Mash the button, hit the bell, do the thing. This and every other interview comes with bonus questions. More fun conversation that's not in today's episode? Text MEMBER to 332-877-9540 or go to heybaggageclaim.com slash support. Let's get to it. Ali, so you gave me this gorgeous visual the last time we chatted of you and your cousin in your teen years in yeah. Pakistan, reading old bootlegged copies of books. You want to set me up for that? Set that up for me a little bit? Yeah, I was uh, when I was fourteen. My parents sent me back to Pakistan to live with my aunt, yeah. and she had four sons, and I was the that was the oldest of four siblings in my family. But here, I was the youngest out of five, uh, so I was the youngest cousin. I was living with them, and so my roommate was my cousin, right? And He's, I think, maybe five years older than me, or something. So, and he had this entire shelf full of these really cheaply photocopied, uh, you know, you get these pirated bootleg books yeah. um, in Pakistan. And and there was he had the entire Bertrand Russell collection. <laughs> so this is in yeah, this is in Pakistan in the uh, let's see, in the I guess the late eighties, and I just devoured them like yeah. all of it. And it was, it was funny because he is, uh, he was a math student. Now he's a math professor in the U.S. Um, and he, yeah, so I just, he just used to talk to me about it. I, I used to read them. We had all these conversations. And the funny thing is that his younger brother, who's also my cousin, he used to stay in the room, the next room, uh, ended up becoming a, what they call a malana. So he's a, like a religious cleric now. So he does religious lectures. He's got the turban and the beard and everything like that. You know, he speaks at funerals and things. He's, he's one of those guys. So it was two to totally different. Uh, the two brothers, everybody got along. We had all these conversations, but I ended up leaning more towards the Bertrand Russell side. Yeah. What um, do you think that's biology? Like what, what happened to make those two brothers go such opposite directions? Uh, yeah. I, yeah, so I don't know. This would all be speculation. Yeah. Um, but I think that, yeah, I, I think a lot of it has to do with the kind of education you have, um, mm. you know, the, the kind of things that you're into. There's probably some biological element to it, and we, we've seen that, that there are some mm. people who are more prone to sort of more rigid thinking and dogmatic thinking, um, uh, people who are, who appeal to, I mean, they've seen this with conservatives and, and liberals, that, right. you know, authoritarians, type of thinking actually appeals more to the conservative mindset um whereas more of an open progressive kind of mindset appeals to to liberals so there may be something biological going on there but um i think a lot of it had to do with the study of things so one of the brothers the one who i was roommates with with the bertrand russell collection uh he was a math student he was studying math so he was really into 
logic, math, rationality, uh, you know, just right. critical thinking, making sense of things, logical fallacies. We learned about a lot, a lot about logical fallacies from him. And, you know, he was out buying Bertrand Russell books. Yeah. Uh, and the other one was uh, I, he was doing an engineering degree, um, which is completely different. It was like an applied sciences thing. Mm. And he had completely different interests. Right. It, it's it's always interesting to me that whenever even and I'm, both of these guys are great guys. I know that yeah, you know, they're yeah. completely different. I mean, they're my cousins and um, I get along with them both. But there is a, anytime you have some kind of terrorist attack or, you know, it's always like an engineer or a doctor, you know, I'm an also why here he's a doctor. You never hear, right. oh, you know, this guy who's a he was a liberal arts student at this <laughs> college or that college. Right, and, right. you know, he went and blew up a train. That never happens. You don't hear that kind of thing or a math professor doing things like that. So it is, I do wonder about that, that why, that, you know, when you have these sort of applied sciences type of uh, the people who have those kinds of educations tend to be overrepresented in incidents like this and religious extremism. Yeah. Do you, do you think those types of folks, n not obviously one for one, but tend to, for whatever reason, correlate more strongly with a, a conservative, more dogmatic approach to life? Yeah, I, um, it might be. And again, this is all speculation. I mean, in my book, I wrote about the difference between, like, I, I went to grad school, um, mm. but I also went to medical school. So there's a huge difference between medicine and science. People think, okay, there's science, life sciences and there's medicine. Mm. They're all, so if, but, but they're completely different. You know, when you, when you have, like, if you look at the majority of Nobel Prizes given out in medicine, they're usually the PhDs. Right? It's not the people who prescribe the drugs, it's the people who invent the drugs. Yeah. And it's a completely different mindset, and it's a completely different, uh, you know, one is the basic science, for instance, is more exploratory. My degree was in, like, biochemistry and uh, in right. in, uh, molecular biology. And you can go off on tangents, yeah. right? You can say, well, this isn't working, let me try it this and let me go off on this tangent and see what happens and that's how a lot of great scientific yeah. discoveries were made you know alexander fleming right. just a lazy man who let us you know <laughs> his culture dishes catch mold and then he's like oh the bacteria are dying you know penicillin they isolated it from the mold so a lot of great scientific discoveries were made on tangents now if you're a cardiac surgeon or an er doctor you can't say well, let me go on this tangent and see what happens. You can't, you can't do that because you're going to get sued or you're going to lose your license. You have to follow the protocols and the yeah. scientists uh, create the protocols. So there is that uh, sort of that creative element mm. um, when it comes to sort of hard sciences or, or pure sciences. And then when it comes to the applied stuff, uh, there is a follower mindset. I mean, you, you can, you make lots of money and you do all that, but you're essentially following protocols. You're not doing a whole lot of um, experimentation or exploration. So yeah. maybe that has something to do with it. I think that applies to um, like physics versus engineering as well, for instance. You, you said, you mentioned that you sort of aligned a little more with the first cousin you'd mentioned, the one who was a little more um, free thinking and yeah. a little more mathematical although weird to put those two thoughts back to back, but a um, little more free thinking than potentially um, the archetype of a, a more religious zealot. Tell right. me, tell me about that part of your psychology. Like which part of it? The Has, has that always been something you felt drawn to is a little more on the mathematic side. So what, let's, let's take it to Berth, Bertrand Russell specifically. What, what pulled you into those books? When was the first moment you said, I'm, I'm yeah. going to read all these. Yeah, I, I like it when things make sense. So mm. I never had, uh, I, have, I have, my mind has always been like, things have to fit together. I, mm. I can't compartmentalize. I can't do the Stephen Jay Gold, you know, non-overlapping magisteria, like the, the Noma thing where, right. for example, religion has its own compartment and science has its own compartment and never the twain shall mix, you know, that kind of, I, I can't do that. I know a lot of people can, they make arguments for it, but it doesn't make sense to me. So for me, things have to make sense. Um, I did notice uh, 
I mean, I keep on learning this throughout my life. I've learned it over the last four years too, that that doesn't necessarily work for most people. Mm. For a lot of people, emotionality, appeal to emotion is is more compelling, right? Than things yeah. actually making rational or logical right. linear sense. So, but, but for me, th- things had to make sense. So I have the same sort of set of criteria to apply to anything. So if there's a religious claim, you know, if, if there's an, a scientific claim about evolution that we all evolved, yeah. right? And there's gaps in the record. You'll have all the religious people saying, well, there's gaps in the record. You know, what happened between these two species? And, you know, we don't know, we don't have any fossils for this era or that era. Um, but when you look at the religious record and, you know, the, the God split the moon in half, as it says in the Quran, I mean, like that's something that I think quite a few people would have witnessed. It would have doc- been documented <laughs> more than by more than just like you know a guy in seventh century arabia and you know some i think the, the, someone told right. us on the other podcast there was a hindu king that also said that the moon was split in half so you you should you should probably have more than two people in the world noticing you know a, a huge like cataclysmic event that like that so um so that doesn't make sense to me so those but the same people who argue about gaps in the evolutionary record are totally okay with the prophet flying to heaven on a winged horse or mm. virgins giving birth or, you know, angels sitting on your shoulders, writing down all your deeds. I mean, those, those kinds of things are just accepted. Uh, so for, for me, it has to be the same criteria to evaluate both sets of claims because those are scientific claims, by the way, like the idea that there are angels are sitting on your shoulders, writing. Oh, down, right. That's, right. That's a scientific claim. You're, you're saying something about the nature of, this world and we need to be able yeah. to figure out what that means. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to go into something that, um, Ed Bridget Fetissey on the podcast recently. Yeah, yeah. And she, she's wonderful, but she talked about <laughs> she, a very different direction here, but, uh, she spent a long time in Australia and, at one point in that time, accidentally joined what was essentially a sex cult. And it, uh, yeah, she, <laughs> she ended up at an Osho ashram in, in like the Australian bush in the middle of nowhere. But she said this thing I thought was really cool. She said, um, you know, this world is chaotic and this world is, um, bizarre and, and, crazy and our minds are scattered but then a rose exists and we can't sort of we can't find any good justification for why the world is as chaotic as it is and how this road rose is here i got i know scientifically we have yeah. figured out evolution so that yeah. <laughs> bad example yeah. but um what she said is is people strive to to put order uh, on to sort of map on order to the chaos. And she was saying this in the context of what she was witnessing as a lot of sort of like lost souls in this sort of bizarre little sex cult she stumbled upon. Mm-hmm. Uh, people who just weren't in the right headspace, people who had sort of given up on their life and on their dreams in a lot of ways. In that moment in her life, Bridget, I think, would count herself as one of them. Um, but just psychologically that desire to, to map on order to the chaos. The reason I'm bringing this up is I'm hearing threads of that, both in your articulation of your more religiously oriented, uh, cousin and you, I'm hearing p- bits, a desire to no, we, we can figure this out. Let's understand what the hell is yeah. going on here. Um, I, I don't know that there was a question that maps onto that perfectly. Um, no, that's, uh, yeah, that is a good point. I, 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 the order chaos sort of dichotomy, I don't think mm. it's as clean as people think it is. And, um, th- th- there are patterns to everything. One, you know, one thing about human beings is that's really interesting is that, uh, we are, very good at picking up patterns. Mm. I mean, I, I can't remember who said this. I think it was, I think it was Ray Kurzweil who said this about 
uh, when Gary Kasparov played the chess game yeah. with the IBM, the the blue machine. I, I can't remember the name of it, but and he said that that you know a human being could probably think four or five chess moves in advance, can probably sort of conceive what is the average person, but that a machine can think pretty much infinitely, like yes. all of the different permutations. So why was it so close? You know, ultimately the machine did beat him, I right. think, but why was it so close? Why was it so well thought out? And uh, it's because of patterns, because human beings can can recognize patterns. And we can get patterns out of chaos. I mean, I think of this in like in medical school, one of the things I enjoyed the most was my psych rotations. And, you know, you'd see somebody who's schizophrenic or who's going through manic episodes, got bipolar disorder, and nothing makes sense. Everything they're saying is just seems like it seems completely random and off, you know, just mm. it doesn't make any sense. And then you read about the kinds of things that they're thinking, like the, the, what, what the disorder does to your brain and the yeah. way that it makes you think. And you break it down to the different kinds of delusions. You break it down into speech patterns like flight of ideas, where I could start talking about the chair I'm sitting on and then talking about the barber because chair rhymes with hair, you know, things like right. that. And then when you start picking up these patterns and you see this in patient after patient after patient, mm. you realize that there is, there, is, uh, there is a pattern to the chaos yeah. and it has predictive value, right? Once you know what you know, right. you know what kind of chaos you're dealing with. You can actually predict, based on observations and symptomatology, the kind of uh, pattern that you're going to see and the kind of behavior you're going to see. And I think it's like that in in nature too. I mean, I'll say one more thing about this. Richard Feynman very famously hmm. talked about, and I think Richard Dawkins talked about this too in Unweaving the Rainbow. Uh, but Richard Feynman, the physicist. Uh, he talked about how people say, well, there's the beauty of a flower and a bee coming to pollinate it. And why why are we dissecting it? If you dissect it scientifically, then it loses all its wonder and it loses all its beauty. Mm -hmm. And he said that that's, that's just bullshit. Oh, what can I say? I can swear? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. He just said, yeah, he was, he was like, that's bullshit because I'm paraphrasing him. I don't think he actually said that. But um, because you have to think about these things. You know, when you start dissecting it, you look at the flower. Well, what is it in the flower that makes color? Why did it evolve to be that way? Was it to attract the bees because they're dependent on the bees to reproduce? Mm -hmm. And what does that mean for the bees? Do the bees with their elementary, you know, central nervous systems, are they able to appreciate color? Are they, do they have an aesthetic sense? Do they have a sense of what's beautiful and what looks good and what's attractive and what's not based on sight and color? Um, and these questions, they come up and, and suddenly you know, the more you dive into it, it actually increases the wonder and the awe. And you start getting more answers and you do start finding patterns and sense in the chaos. So, so for me, it's not about trying to impose a sense of order on the chaos, but it's trying to find, you know, the order that, that, that I, I just don't think it's two different things. I think mm. the chaos is, uh, of course, there's a lot of chaos. It's a lot of it's mm. real, but I, I think the more you look into it, there's an order to the chaos. And it's and, and you can, as human beings, we have the ability to find the patterns. So that, that's the whole beauty of life is learning things, exploring, learning about nature. And learning about nature is actually, there's a word called, for it. It's called science. Like science right. is the study of right. nature, right? Hello there. That was too aggressive. Anyway, I'm Will. Uh, if you're enjoying this conversation, I that would be good. Uh, yeah. What am I trying to do? Oh, right. The membership. Look, I'm not going to try to sell you anything that you can't see my feet, but I'm not wearing all birds and you can see my head and you'll note that I'm not taking hair loss prevention products. So yeah, nothing to sell you, but, uh, there is one thing I have a membership section. If you're enjoying this conversation with Ali or you're enjoying any of the other conversations here on Baggage Claim, I have bonus questions, extra stuff that I didn't include directly in this. I'm not going to leave you on a cliffhanger. This thing doesn't end in some annoying place, uh, but it would mean the world if you become a member at that cost, whatever you want it to cost, literally $1 through to a million dollars, however much you want to pay for that. That's totally up to you. Anyway, if you're interested, heybaggageclaim.com slash support 
or text MEMBER, if you're in the U.S. or Canada, MEMBER to 332 uh, That's all I got for you. Enjoy. See you out there. There, There isn't a zero-sum game between order and chaos or wonder and science. The, you, mm. Scientific discovery leads to more wonder. We're, if there is a yeah. finite amount of information to learn in this place, we are still at the very beginning, and every question we answer yields 300,000 yeah, more questions. <laughs> I, I gotta say that, that, and that's one of the things, like even living in Saudi Arabia and growing up mm. in Fox, and one, one of the reasons that I became more uh, sort of uh, scientifically prone rather than, like mm. even science and art to me is a it's very, very blurry line between the two. You think of them as two different entities, right. but you know, I had the creation story on one side. It's like, you know, God said, let there be light. And there was light. You know, right. God is always Indian every time I, <laughs> but I could do that. I'm, I'm a brown guy. I have licenses. But, I, I can't. I'll let you do the accents and I'll <laughs> just know, sit over here and giggle at them. Yeah, it's really it's like the humor things become really tough for white people nowadays. I feel no, bad. Oh, man. Uh, you're not privileged like me. Um, the, <laughs> but there's, so you not have something I hear very often, by the way. Oh, You're not well, privileged you, you, like me. You should actually. So that's that's a whole <laughs> different topic. But I'm sure, I, I'm sure we'll get there. <laughs> yeah, but I, you know, and I, and I think of the the Big Bang theory, which is yeah. a theory, right? It's a, a proposal of how everything was created, and then I, you know, they say, well, the Big Bang started from that, you know, little speck, and the, mm-hmm. it was the beginning of sp- matter and time, space and time. That means there was no such thing as time at the Big Bang. So when people say what happened before the Big Bang, there, if you don't have time... Conceptually misunderstanding what that was. <laughs> yeah, you don't, there's no such thing as before. You right. can't have a before if time doesn't exist. So now you're thinking... So it's, I think, uh, you know how they say if you're standing on the North Pole and someone mm-hmm. tells you to go north, you can't. The question doesn't make sense. You're standing right on the North right. Pole. So... You can't say what happened before the Big Bang. Um, and that blew my mind because I, I couldn't pr- – that's something that's even hard for human beings to imagine because mm. we think of everything in a, in a sort of a temporal context. Yeah. Um, and that was just so much more compelling to me than let there be light and there was light um, or the Genesis, any, any given creation story in any religion really. So I um, – I, I gravitated towards it. And the other thing is there's evidence for it. Like the idea that time, you know, when you have uh, just sort of higher levels of gravity, gravitational force, time slows down. And when you have less gravitational force, time speeds up. And that's right. why you have the GPS satellites have to be corrected constantly mm. um, because of this effect. Uh, so, th- th- I mean, th- there are so many things in science that are actually... I, they're much more, they're almost, you know, I don't want to say the word spiritual, but they are, they're transcendental. Oh, in a oh way, absolutely. Experience. Well, a big, a big part of the reason is spirituality is, tends to be rooted in reality plus human narrative on top, right? Mm-hmm. And what the, I, I, I don't want to speculate on the reason that uh, the idea of, the idea of, sort of your your idea of time not being able to exist and there's no human processing that can comprehend what before that meant or didn't and why that's more powerful to you than a sentence in a several thousand year old book is probably because they were they were um several thousand years ago adding narrative to what they understood the universe to look like in that moment and mm-hmm. you are comprehending or failing to comprehend what we understand about moments now, which is far more powerful because we've had let there be light in our collective consciousness for centuries, millennia. S- <laughs> yeah, six. Th- I mean, it depends when you when you start counting. But um, yeah, the, the, let there be light has been a sentence in the collective vernacular for some time, <laughs> and this thing doesn't go back before the thing started. And we yeah. can't figure out what that meant is something we've really internally understood for like 30 or 40 years and sometimes mm-hmm. still to a person don't don't comprehend. Yeah. So there's yeah. much more beauty in that. And that's to your point before, science 
the advancement of science creates more wonder. It doesn't necessarily take it away for reasons oh, yeah. exactly like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I tell I tell my sort of religious people. I've I've sort of a big extended family. I've got cousins and so and they always mm -hmm. like asking me questions because I'm like the, the atheist in the family. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And many of them are, you know, they're they're raised Muslim. Their parents are Muslim. Yeah. And they ask me like, what, you know, what about? Uh, and and I, I well, I tell them even if you're religious. You know, the Quran, for instance, tells you to look at the creation around you and study the creation around you. And like, if you want to know God, and you believe in God, you want to get to know him, study what he created. Turn around, look at nature, look at what he created. Mm -hmm. And in the Quran, it says there are signs in nature for those who reflect. And if you if you really follow that, again, you study nature, there's a word for it. It's called mm -hmm. science. Yeah. The mm -hmm. study of nature is science. That's what it is. Um, and I find that that actually pushes them more towards scientific inquiry mm. and curiosity, things like that, than, you know, when you kind of speak their language in a way. Yeah. But I, I really think it's powerful and this dichotomy between their science and this faith and this religion, it's, it's very damaging because, you know, they're just completely missing out on, you know, when people think of science as a super mm. left brained, logical, uh, you know, point A to point B to point C type thing. It's it's not like that. Yeah. So I want to I want to get us into a little more of your backstory because I will have set you up a little <laughs> before this episode, um, before people are at this point, but they are definitely confused as to how we got here and why you're on a travel podcast right now. So <laughs> let's uh, let's backtrack. So you spend many of your formative years. Tell me if I'm not mistaken. Saudi Arabia, Libya, and Pakistan. Is that, is that that's correct? right yeah. Yeah, yeah and you moved well first of all t take me through that experience you you and i spoke before this and you told me that you felt a little bit like you were living almost in a a bubble within this larger bubble this idea of uh kind of having freedom and then the outside world that was restrictive in various in various theocratic ways was right. just kind of the place where you went to the grocery store yeah, I was in, uh, so I was in an American school in Saudi Arabia. So I lived mm -hmm. in, like, we started my, I think when I was six months old, I was born in Pakistan, then we moved to Libya. My parents were professors, so, you know, they, they taught at the University of Tripoli uh, for several years. And then we moved to Saudi, and, and we moved to Riyadh, which is the capital of Saudi Arabia. And so Saudi Arabia is basically, at that time especially, it was it's like the Taliban with a lot of money, yeah. right? And a lot of U.S. support. So, you know, there it's... Yeah. It's, you know, women can't drive. You know, women need permission from their husbands or to, to be able to go outside. And yeah, I mean, you, you know how it is. It's capital punishment. There's beheadings in the public square, and you know all that stuff. It's um, so that's the kind of place it was. And within Saudi Arabia, I was a part of a Pakistani sort of moderate to liberal Muslim family who said, "Okay, yeah, we're Muslims and they're Muslims, but we're not like them. Like these right. are sort of fundamentalists. They're totally crazy." Uh, but you know, there's more to life than that. And my parents are, you know, they're Muslim, so they're more liberal, Western educated, and so on. Mm -hmm. And then I went to an American school because in Saudi Arabia, uh, you, you can't like the Saudis can't go to the foreigner schools, and the foreigners can't go to the Saudi schools. Right. So I was in a school that had, I think, 80 people from 80 different nationalities. It was about 2,000 kids, and. Uh, it was an American school, so it was mostly American Canadian people, uh, yeah. a lot of people from Scandinavia, uh, Scandinavian countries. So yeah. Phillips Erickson was one of the companies that was in Saudi Arabia. So oh, all okay. of their right. people, sure. their kids, um, and it was just very, you know, at the very ethnically diverse, linguistically diverse, all kinds of different languages, different cultures, uh, and that was normal for me. You know, mm -hmm. I, was, I was there from like the second grade all the way until like the ninth grade. And then even high school, I did in a similar school, yeah. foreigner. So that was very normal to me, seeing people from all kinds of different countries, speaking all kinds of different languages, everybody yeah. bringing different kinds of lunch to school and food. And um, I, I, that, that's something I normalized. But then I had this Pakistani family and I was super conservative outside of that when we went to the grocery store, as you said. Mm -hmm. So, uh, th yeah, that was, I'd say an, it's an interesting experience to me now. At that time, it was just normal. I thought that's how things were because mm -hmm. that's all I knew. 
And I remember, <laughs> I remember going back to Pakistan when I was 14, when I went to live with my cousins. Right. Uh, and we used to visit Pakistan, but like going and living there and everybody was brown and everybody spoke the same language. Everybody, it felt like I was like, oh, this feels like a really racist place. It feels segregated. Right. It's like everyone's the same race, everyone's the same ethnicity, everyone speaks the same language. Um, like this seems like a downgrade mm. to me. Uh, so that, that was a that was a strange experience. And I think we talked about whether there was culture shock when I came to Canada, because I came to Canada when I was 24. Right. And I was telling you that for me, surprisingly, it was the opposite. It felt when I came to Canada in Toronto, it felt more like the school I went to when I was a kid. And yeah, I, so it, it felt like the freedom that you had within that world expanding to everywhere. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. freedom that I had only while I was going to school, definitely <laughs> right. not in the country, but right. not in Saudi Arabia. But coming here, it seemed like this entire country was like the school I went to. Yeah. What right? uh, What brought you to, you started in Canada and I believe did more, you had more education in the U.S., but Canada is predominantly where you've spent time in the Western world, too. Yeah, so so we immigrated. My parents, when they they left Saudi Arabia, um, and then they went to Pakistan for a couple of years, and it was they just decided to immigrate. At that time, Canada was looking for immigrants. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. They had a big immigration drive happening in the 90s. Uh, so they applied for it. They came here. Um, the idea was to have their kids go to colleges right. all of us were about to at some point go to college with four right. brothers and sisters um and we and I, I was doing medical school in pakistan at the time uh, so i came here when i was 24 around 99 we start medical school right after high school there right. uh so yeah that's so th- that's the reason that we came uh to canada initially do you um so, so that you were early to mid twenties by the time you ended up in Canada, and it sort of—it seems like it kind of felt like your world expanding a little yeah. bit in that moment. Um, I'm I'm gonna tie this into a conversation that we had prior, so I have to summarize that conversation for our poor listeners who I don't <laughs> envy in this moment. But in our prior conversation, your your daughter, who is now hopefully in bed, we're recording this conversation fairly late in the evening. She, but she's asleep. Yeah, yeah she, she's, she's not asleep. partying out. Yeah, no. But uh, in our prior conversation, she came in, we met, and she's adorable. Uh, but we had this whole kid. She, how old is she? Four? Three, four? four? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but we talked about how she sort of snapped online. She came into consciousness during coronavirus, right? She and did, yeah, yeah. And so there's this idea of um, her earliest memories are going to be in this sort of restrictive environment. Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've, yeah, I'm not a psychologist, but I can only imagine that's going to have long tail psychological impacts that I'd be curious about. She's a very well adjusted <laughs> young, yeah. young lady. So I'm sure, um, I'm sure those things will, those things will be like wonderful quirks in the future. But what I'm recognizing sort of in this moment and as you were just speaking is that in the same way that she spent her early years in this restrictive environment that hopefully going forward um, will be far less restrictive and this will be a sort of yeah. odd early life memory, you for you experienced something fairly similar but for a lot longer and probably a lot more intense from a, yeah. prior to 24 and then coming into this sort of new life. Do you have any thoughts on maybe how that's impacted who you are? Going yeah, that, that's a really interesting parallel, right? That's a, yeah, that's a really interesting parallel. I, I never thought of it that way, but yeah, you're right. I mean, she has normalized the idea that, you know, you just have to wear masks everywhere you go in public right. and you can't shake hands with people. And, um, you know, sometimes you go to school in person, but if there's a case, then you have to go home and right. do online school for two weeks. And, and these things are, you can only visit certain people. You can't really go out to eat all the time. Like those are things that have for a year and a half now been part of her consciousness as it's developing and as, right. as it's evolving. So you're, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, I, I don't, well, one thing that's different um, in my case and hers, aside from the time span is that 
the whole world's in this situation. Mm-hmm. So everybody in her generation, right, in her age, there would be overlap. She could talk to somebody be. from any place on the planet who's her age, and they'll have this right. experience. Yeah. Yeah, like they can sit and she's in her 20s, she's sitting in Beirut with somebody yeah. local and they will have, they'll talk about those experiences, like you know, what you're doing during that time and how life is different now. In my case, it was uh, sort of more unique. Mm. So when it opened up, I think one of the things that happened is, and this has actually led to why I ultimately ended up writing uh, my first book too, mm. is that when I came to... Uh, the West, it was 99. And then in 2001 is when 9-11 happened. And there were all of these perspectives that people had. And there were people who had lived there and there were people who were living here. And most of the people talking about it here had only lived here. And most of the people t- talking about it there mm-hmm. were had only lived there. Mm-hmm. And uh, that so I was hearing these perspectives, and you know what happens with perspectives here, right? It's the left and the right, conservative right. and there's liberal, and right. um, I just felt like there was a perspective that wasn't being heard. And I thought uh, for a long time, I thought maybe I'm wrong. You know, these guys are all commentators or writing for all these articles. For somebody's got to know somewhere. Someone's got to know. Like, what yeah. do I know? Yeah. Um, and then more, the more I started talking to people about it, just privately, or yeah. you know, and. You know, in, I was in grad school at the time, or you know, just people I worked with in the lab and so on. I realized that there was a perspective they hadn't heard before, mm. and they actually found it very compelling. And I'd hear these, and like, oh, I never thought about it that way, mm. right? Any kind of conflict, you know, you see, like what's happening with Israel and Palestine, the Israel-Palestine mm. conflict. Yeah, is there a military occupation? Are they expanding settlements? And is that wrong? Yeah, of course it's wrong. I mean, this is twenty twenty one. That's not something that you do. But on the other hand, you know, is there an anti-Semitic element? Are a lot of is there a lot of anti-Semitism in the mm. Arab world? Is it all about the occupation? No, there are people who really, really hate the Jews there too. Mm. You know, that's the, both of these things are true, and you you can have more than one thought in your head. You can have more than one perspective uh, in your mind at the same time. You know, like you have that you have people on the left saying that you know Muslims are targeted in the West by Donald Trump or by whoever. So we need to respect everything that the Quran says. We have to put on these hijabs and, and, and go out and in the women's march and put on these American flag hijabs and cover our heads. And then you have people in Iran who are taking off their hijabs because it's forced onto them. Right. You know, as a form of modesty culture or rape culture, they're the same thing. Um, and they're fighting for it, and they're looking at their fellow liberals in the U.S. doing the same thing and wondering, like, what happened? <laughs> like, what's going on? Like, there, so there are, there are many, um, and then you have the the right wing that's talking about actually banning them, and you know, all Muslims from this country or that country, like, we have to have a travel ban for this entire country. And if that travel ban was in place, then I wouldn't be here. Ion Hersieli wouldn't be here. Even people who support those right. kinds of measures, a lot of them. <clears throat> Who made it here wouldn't be here because they would be considered Muslim by, um, you know, these sort of the, the more right wing folks. Right. So all of these perspectives are wrong. All of them mm-hmm. are, or they're partially right. But but there's no, and, and so I think that that was the. This is a very long answer to your question, but I think that that was the um, when the world opened up. I think for me there was I realized that I had a unique perspective not on purpose, but just because of the experiences that I had and what I had seen. Um, and that's why I decided to talk about it more. Yeah, I just, now is a good moment to plug your first book, so I'm going to let you do that. <laughs> and I have a, <laughs> I have a yeah. whole bunch of questions for you stemming from what you just said, but tell uh-huh. folks where to find your first book. Oh, my first book is called The Atheist Muslim, mm-hmm. A Journey from Religion Which, to Which, by the Region. way, is one of my favorite names in all of book titling. So, yeah, the, <laughs> the Atheist mother, Muslim. That's, yeah. yeah, the publishers loved it. And people are like, they're, they're like, you know, the title is an oxymoron. I'm like, whoa, really? I had no idea. <laughs> yeah, They're totally okay with it. And I've said this before. They're fine with a movie like Back to the Future. Mm-hmm. It's okay. But like, yeah, The Atheist Muslim, it's just about uh, a lot of the uh, countries and a lot of Muslim-majority countries uh, atheism 
is very taboo. It's uh, people get killed for it. They get there are thirteen countries. Well, now there are twelve uh, where atheism is punishable by death. Right. In Saudi Arabia, it's considered a terrorist offense as of twenty fourteen. So. Um, it is a very so a lot of people have to be there's you know millions and millions of atheists in the Muslim world. Polling has shown that, mm. including in Saudi Arabia, where you know at least five percent of people, over a million people, are a confirmed atheists. Nineteen percent say they're non-religious, according to like a Gallup poll from 2013. So the, the numbers are really really big, but they all have to hide it. So they are sort of living contradictions. They're mm. atheists in thought, but Muslim in presentation. Right. And that was, a, that was a whole. That was mm-hmm. one of the points of the book, but yeah. And anyway, the book you can you can get on Amazon. It's it's a few years old now, so you may not find it in all the bookstores. But if you want to get it for bookstores, you can get it for yeah. bookstores too. So it's also it's not lost on me that the name of your podcast, the Secular Jihadist, follows a <laughs> similar naming convention. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you, you can't create all that much more stuff before you gotta come up with a new trick. I think. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah, I think that that was twice. I actually didn't come up with secular jihadists. That wasn't my. That wasn't my idea. But I, it appealed to me immediately. I was like, this yeah, is great. Yeah. So, I've I've found in conversation that first generation immigrants tend to have a particularly fascinating perspective in most political conversations um, because they tend to air what would what would traditionally be considered liberal with the sort of interesting twist that when people get particularly negative about a present environment, they they usually have the backdrop to shut that dialogue down pretty quickly. So the U.S. is the most racist country of all time. Any dialogue <laughs> like that, like, yeah. I spent a fair amount of time in Pakistan, I can tell you that's not the case. Those yeah. types of things. Um, or the U.S. is the worst on this human right. They're like, well, have you seen what's happening in China? Those Those yeah. types of dialogues. Hey there, Will Conway here. Man, I, I'm just getting bored with these. I gotta come up with new benefits for you guys so they are more interesting and fun to make. Anyway, my name is Will. If you are interested, this conversation and every other conversation on Baggage Claim with Ayla and Bridget Fetisi and Jacqueline Trumbull, those all come with bonus questions and bonus content, content, content. If you want more of it, hey, baggageclaim.com slash support or Text member to three three two eight seven seven nine five four zero. Content, content. It's good content. You, we said again in the prior conversation that we had. You set up this idea specifically on the point that I just made a moment ago of racism in the United States and then you touched on it a little bit earlier and sort of an offhand maybe you maybe you should be being told a little bit more that you uh, are less privileged than you're <laughs> led to believe uh, take me into that dialogue because you've had some fairly fascinating conversations about this on your own podcast one of which I was listening to not two hours ago so yeah yeah, I think that if you have, uh, it, again, it comes down to what I was saying earlier about yeah. the perspective. If you've lived around the world and you've seen how the world is, there's, you know, I, I think people who've only lived here and only read about the world outside mm. uh, don't understand. I, I feel like there's a lot of things that people in the U.S. and people in Canada tend to take for granted. You know, mm. freedom of speech is one of them, for instance, right? Like they don't understand. Like there is a slippery slope. You know, you can't. A lot of times, you can't make certain exceptions, no matter how unpalatable they are and what people are saying. Because if you do that, you're going down a slippery slope to to worse things. Um, and the same thing goes with this conversation on racism. I got loved. Like I had this. Uh, at a, I did a. There's a website called Letter. Dot Wiki. Mm. I don't know if you know about it, but I'm not familiar. It's uh, where they'll take two people to disagree on a topic and we write each other letters. So yeah. I 
was part of a conversation on this, you know, Black Lives Matter and police mm-hmm. shootings, and and it was with Matt Thornton, okay, uh, in, in California, and so so you know we actually talked about this. And one of the things that we agreed on was, you know, I, I told him I was like, I, I don't think I think I think the U.S. and Canada are probably two of the least racist countries in the world. Um, the racism is visible, yeah. and that's a testament to. Um, it's the idea that people uh, they want to have a conversation about it, that the conversation is out in the open. Mm. And that doesn't happen. Saudi Arabia, where I was living, right, mm. uh, had a different salary system for people from different nationalities. So they'd look at your passport, and based on the nationality you had, for the same job that my dad had, a white man, an American white man, would get almost twice the amount of money that he did. Uh, someone who was Filipino would get less. Someone who was mm-hmm. Saudi would get more. So it was it was tiered according to the salary system was tiered uh, according to um, you know where you were from, your nationality. Uh, in places like uh, India and in places like Pakistan, there's a lot of racism against black people. You know, people think that it's the U.S. isn't the only country in the world that enslaved black people. Um, they were enslaved in Arabia as well. In fact, even in Islamic history, uh, you know, Muhammad, one of his slaves, his name is Bilal. He freed one of the black slaves, and then he's the one who did the very first prayer call because apparently he had a beautiful voice. So there's documentation of this everywhere. Um, and t- t- to this day, there's, I mean, I have, I have, a, you know, I told you I have a big extended family. I have a family where there are people in my own extended family the daughters came home with a black man and said, I, I want to marry this guy, all hell would bro- break loose. I mean, it's just uh, minorities are not immune to racism. In fact, to say that, okay, black people can't be racist or brown people can't be racist, you know, against anybody else, any other race, is kind of a racist statement itself because, you know, you're saying, what, only white people can be racist and other people can't? That's, that's, you know, that's a racist statement in itself. So well, it's also, I mean, at, at some level, it's just infantilizing, which again is a form of racism. But yeah, it is. It's uh, there's yeah. I, I had a conversation. I'm trying to figure out if this conversation is coming up before or after. Yeah. So this will be out by the time people are hearing this audio. So this yeah, will yeah. make sense. Um, Chloe Valdari was was on the show. Yeah, and Chloe is one of the most brilliant minds i she's she's wonderful mm. but one of the things she said is that to take away my ability to oppress you is oppressive like if you're saying that me being really upset can't even hurt you that's that's really that's deeply upsetting to me that you're saying i can have no negative imp- <laughs> right that's one yeah. of the most racist things you could uh yeah could I, take away from. I i i i would hate that well if i was really if i really really hated a certain race and then they didn't care about it they're like it's okay i understand why you hate me <laughs> How condescending. Like, imagine, imagine if i hate imagine if i hated white people and every white person I was going up to, so I said I hated it. It's all right. Don't worry about it. You can hate me as much as you want to because you're oppressed. That would piss me off. That's, that's, or, that's Orwellian. That's <laughs> wow. The you also a great screenplay. Yeah, it's <laughs> oh, all the right screenplays that. here, man. No, it's just, I, so. I think that this, yeah, they uh, people tend to simplify these conversations a lot. And mm. uh, honestly, I don't think I think a lot of this discourse is really on Twitter Mm. and increasingly I'm convinced that Twitter is just not very representative of regular everyday people as much as we like to think it's influential yes but it's just not as representative and I I think that most people do understand that um, Asian people can be very racist I grew up in places that were extremely racist I mean Northern Africans Arab North Africans, yeah. uh, the way they are towards sub-Saharan, like black Africans, uh, even if they're the same religion, even if they're all Muslim, uh, is just important. You, you wouldn't believe it. Yeah. That there's actual slavery happening in places like Libya, as we speak right now. 
Okay, there, there is. Uh, I mean, these are things that we've all. The way that Arabs feel about Palestinians, <laughs> like the, the, the all stand up for Palestinians, but they're not going to help them out because they don't like the Arabs. They have certain, um, they have certain prejudices against Palestinians, and you know, it's it's they all. A lot of times, they don't like Israel even more. So, you know, the, the Palestinians sort of become a pawn in that battle. Uh, they got caught in the middle, but like, I mean, there's a lot of the, the world is complicated, man. Yeah. It's not that, and not every white person like this. This whole idea that you know white people and there's this thing called whiteness. I don't know what that means. I, I don't think like this this idea that you know if you have a people of color day at a university, then they they'll say, "Can white people please stay home and not?" I mean, you wouldn't have had a civil rights movement if you didn't have people like the majority white people supporting. Them and just a lot of them getting behind it. You wouldn't have had uh, a, a liberation for for LGBT folks, right? For gay, lesbian tr- folks, because if you didn't have loads of people who were straight who stood in solidarity with them, uh, or you wouldn't have had a, a feminist movement, equal rights for women, if if you didn't have a lot of men who came together and said, "No, you know, we we were going to stand for this," and spoke to other men about it. And yeah. were involved, and there was communication. Like the, there's a, uh, so I, I actually, you know, I think I think the way it is right now with the wokeness and like yeah. the whole anti woke thing has become a bit of a religion too now. But um, it's yeah, it's a, it's a real pet peeve because it's anti progressive, it's anti liberal, right? It's just as dogmatic as anything else. Yeah, I you you mentioned the idea of Twitter being hopefully an echo chamber that doesn't quite it's not quite emblematic of real life i i Mm -hmm. want to be that optimistic i have two things working against me in getting there yeah the first is the particular moment that we're in that's hopefully on the tail end for somebody who discovers Mm -hmm. this at some point in the future (laughs) we're hopefully late stage coronavirus conversation here um the the reality is unfortunately a hell of a lot of the conversation that's happening in the world right now is happening online nowhere else um and there there isn't a lot of recourse to tone yourself down from that because you're not having the dialogues that you might ordinarily have in the workplace in person at a bar with your buddies those types of things just Mm -hmm. aren't happening quite the same way yeah that's right that is right the the second Particular, and this one's a little more devastating to me because I, I don't necessarily see an end date on this one. Two studies came out last summer. The first study that we have here is by Jordan Moss and Peter O'Connor, published in Helion. And that's this one out of, I believe, New South Wales. They identified several political corners of of the of the spectrum, but they they identified three that are particularly pertinent for the conversation. One is politically correct authoritarianism. The other is politically correct liberalism. So the distinction there, while politically correct liberalism tends to exist as a more benign form of sort of self censorship, politically politically correct authoritarians actively and proactively assert their perspective on political correctness on the rest of the world, right? Mm -hmm. Does that distinction make sense? There's an internal component as opposed to an external. And then you have white identitarianism, which they align fairly seamlessly with the Mm alt-right. So the reason I say all this is the, when you, when you line up dark triad traits, which for, for listeners, a dark triad is sort of a psychological term that covers narcissism, psychopathy, and what was the last one? Machiavellianism. Machiavellianism. Nailed it. Mm-hmm. So those three traits, when you when you study what quantity of traits or, or what where people fall on those three spectrums and where they land in sort of the dark triad the intersection, uh, folks who are who strongly cor- who landed in the white identitarian box 
and the politically correct authoritarian box have strong correlations to um, to dark triad traits. Oh, that's so that's interesting. So right. So go. both yeah. ends of the political spectrum. But then you layer on an additional component here. This study came out from Cato uh, a couple weeks later. The Cato study covers um, what percentage of folks have political opinions they're afraid to share. So this is last July, July 22nd of 2020. More Americans than ever, 62% have political opinions they're, they're afraid to share. But it lines up on a political spectrum in a way that's particularly interesting in that basically everybody is more afraid to share in this current moment except for strong liberals and strong conservatives. And then I did some cross-sectional work based on um, specifically like socioeconomic status and income levels to correlate where those people show up um, by to try to align the Cato Institute study with the New South Wales study. Basically, the way this breaks down is the people in the strong conservative corner are more likely to be dark triad folks, white identitarian dark triad folks, and they feel more comfortable sharing than they've ever felt. And yeah. the same is true on the far left. So you have a moment where basically the categories of people in which um, the categories of people that right now feel most qualified and most willing to share their political opinions are highly saturated with narcissistic Machiavellian sociopaths. Well, that explains Twitter, doesn't it? <laughs> Pretty much explains Twitter. <laughs> that's, that's basically that's the take home <laughs> message for this. Everyone who's listening. Yeah, that's. Twitter's there terrifying. Is. <laughs> no, I, that's I, I mean that's fascinating to me. I think that's um, it is, and it's not surprising. No. But you know, we we were talking about this like the, you you have the woke and then you have the anti woke. They both they're both religions. They really are. Um, and you know, we used to call the woke the regressive left before. I, mm. I wrote I wrote about it in my book as well. Yeah, uh, and you know, it's. Yeah, I agree. I, I agree with you. I, I think that's the issue. But I don't think, you know, to I think what we were talking about earlier was that the the people who are afraid to share their opinions are still, I think, the majority right. of people. And and this isn't right. This isn't you know, when we talk about sharing your opinions. I and mean, this is also a relatively new concept. I mean, when I was growing up, I remember they say, you know, don't talk about politics and religion in the workplace. Don't bring it up with family a whole lot. You know, these are the things. Anybody who talked about politics or religion or shared their opinion about these things was uh, it was rude. You can ask, you can ask people who they voted for. You know, you had the booth and they'd go in and they kept their opinions to themselves. And this is now it's just more of a, a sharing thing. It's it's more acceptable. And in a lot of ways, that's great. Right. In a lot of ways, it's very toxic. Um, so. And and I still think that the majority of people, uh, they and, and you, you saw this in the like you know when you when you actually have people go to the polls, it's different. I mean, you go by Twitter, Labour was going to win in the UK, right. but they suffered their worst defeat since what the 1930s, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. even sort of the a lot of really diehard Labour Party fans they just didn't like uh, Jeremy Corbyn and everything that he was saying. And you know, you had they voted for the conservatives in the in the U.S. in the primary. You would have thought, who thought like Biden was universally hated on Twitter? Nobody liked him. Right. Democrats didn't like him. Conservatives didn't like him. Nobody liked him. And this guy trounced Bernie Sanders, even worse than Hillary Clinton. He trounced him in the primaries, and people just came out and just voted for him. And then same thing in the, in the general election that you couldn't tell him. He seemed like the most boring, sleepy Joe right. type candidate, right. but. There were a lot of other sleepy people, like the silent majority, who were just sitting there, and they they just didn't want all of this uh, talk about how you know, well, Cuba's got a pretty good education system, you know, things like that. Like, let's talk about Cuba's literacy. I mean, that's not this kind of stuff that's going to fly in places like Florida. I'd say right. there are. So it is. I think there is a silent majority, the people that you're saying who are too scared to share their right. opinion. Right. Um, fortunately. 
fortunately, votes count and tweets don't. Yeah. 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 In, in most cases. Votes count and tweets don't. Yeah. So <laughs> you, uh, you are now in Toronto. I am. Yeah. How, how often do you return to any combination of Libya, Saudi Arabia, pa- Pakistan? I can't go there, man. Like I just, uh, there are times I, you know, I grew up there. There are things about it I miss. I miss the food. Mm. I want to go see yeah. my old school. You know, you, you, you want to go drive around your old na- neighborhood yeah, once in a while, yeah. but I can't. Um, Saudi Arabia, I just can't go to because it's just, you know, because of the book, because of, I mean, I've heard from people there. I've gotten threats from people there. Uh, the same thing with Pakistan. Like I, I do want to go at some point. I hope that things open up, but right now it's just, it's still actually quite risky. Things have gotten slightly better though. I gotta say, mm-hmm. like we don't get the same kind of, even a lot of Muslims around the world have become desensitized to the criticism, to the blasphemy. We've come in just a little over 30 years when it was a little over 30 years ago that they wanted to, Salman Rushdie had to go into hiding, yeah. right? Yeah. For writing the satanic verses because everybody wanted to kill him. He had a fatwa on his head. He had a lot of white Westerners actually not supporting the fatwa, but just saying, yeah, you know, he did a really bad thing. He shouldn't have done that. Um, now it's completely different. Things have changed a lot. It's still a long way to go. So maybe one day, but I, I don't get a chance to go back there a whole lot. Hey there, it's a long episode. I gotta do this one more time. Text member to 332-877-9540 or get a, go to heybaggageclaim.com slash support if you're enjoying this conversation. Uh, if you're not enjoying this conversation, please get off my YouTube page before you downvote this video. Please don't downvote this video. Please upvote this video. That would be very nice. Also subscribe, but the main point is the membership. Do the membership thing. Okay. I've ruined my relationship with you now. Goodbye. A lot of people hearing that you wrote a book and now you can't go to these parts of the world, that mm-hmm. that can stop folks in their tracks. And the fact that there are, there are a large number of Westerners who might not be particularly sensitive to like, what is it that's creating this odd bedfellow relationship between um, liberalism, but a very particular brand of liberalism, and um, sort of oppressive theocracy, specifically Islam? Do, do mm-hmm. you have a sense of what's creating that connective tissue there? Why? Why is your story not heralded by the left as this ter- terrifying um, injustice and that, that needs to be rectified? It's just a cultural relativism. And it is, I'll, I'll tell you what it is. It's the bigotry of lowered expectations. Yeah. And I know that's a term that I think someone related to George W. Bush created. And I know he used it at one point, and, mm. uh, but it is absolutely true. I mean, the fact is that you know, as a, as a brown guy, I can go out on the street and I can put my wife and daughter in a burqa from head to toe and just cover them up in the middle of summer and walk around Toronto and no one's going to say anything because they're going to look at and see what I look like. They're like, well, you know, that's their culture. That's what they do. Uh, you do the same thing and you're walking out in your, you know, T-shirt and your hat and you got shorts on and you're a white dude and, you know, you've got your wife covered from head to toe because that's how you want it. And... um they're, they're, they're going to come at you. I'm an they're asshole. Yeah. yeah, they're yeah. going to talk to you about it because there is a they, they hold you to a higher standard of behavior. They're like, well, you're... It, it's, you know, these are progressive liberal people who will look at you and say, well, you're a white, you're one of us. You shouldn't be doing this. For that guy, yeah, he's from a different place. Now, you've seen Borat, right? The first Borat <laughs> yeah. movie? Yeah, it's been and a that, while that, on the first one. But, yeah, yeah, I mean, he... Uh, he he actually exposed this really well. Yeah. So he he just pushes things. I mean, he's showing pictures of him, uh, you know, naked with his son, and doing. He's showing it to like an etiquette person, 
like this etiquette consultant and this poor woman is sitting there and looking at his photos and she's just she's like oh yeah that's you know we don't do that here like as you know that's okay she's being very respectful towards him mm-hmm. there's there's no outrage uh it's it's the bigotry of lowered expectations and that's what happens it is another kind of racism i not i am a i align left liberal and progressive yeah, yeah. as far as it goes but in the real sense of the world a word um, and I, I do think, I think that a lot of the right wing is motivated by bigotry and racism, but this yeah. is a particularly toxic kind of bigotry and racism that exists on the left. Yeah, I, um, yeah, first of all, just yes, just hard yes. It, <laughs> the, I, I want to loop back into a conversation that that we had in a period of time in this conversation that's now gone offline yeah. uh, so <laughs> there uh i sort of offhand made this remark that um is when we were talking about the dark triad i i've lost and it sounds like you have to any sort of animosity towards towards those people like i see it almost as an illness and there's this framing recently that I've I've started to really like to apply practically in my life when when somebody's bothering me in some way, um, or I feel bothered by something, I instead of sort of viscerally knee jerk feeling anger or outrage, I think what would it be like to be in that person's head? Is that an experience I want? Not th- what would it be like to have their stuff, right? Because, mm-hmm. you know, Donald Trump is the first person I actually did this with. Do I want yeah. Donald Trump's stuff? Kind of. Would I trade my life for his? Never in a million years would yeah. I would prefer to be Donald Trump than myself. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so from my perspective, it's it's the greatest empathy tool that I have that I've that I've come to develop. Um, I don't think I've probably heard it somewhere. I'm I'm not an innovator yeah. on this particular topic, but I have come to find that that component of empathy to be really valuable. What would it be like to be this other person? Mm-hmm. Um, and so on that front, when when you find yourself, I'm going to put you in two positions as you communicating with somebody else. One is communicating with a religious zealot. Let's say, let's put you in a bizarre world where one of the people who would potentially want to do you harm if you were to if you were to travel overseas and you sat down in a room. What and another conversation with one of those people who would take issue with my behavior before yours for for bigotry of lowered expectations type reasons. What do you think? Let's put you in in the room with the religious zealot at first. What do you think's going on in their head, and where is that animosity coming from on a on a oh. human level? Yeah, where that human level where it's coming from. I mean, this is something that we've all experienced. We can relate to. It's indoctrination. Yeah. And when you're taught something when you're a kid, when it's beat into you with fear, when all other uh, sort of influences or just avenues of knowledge have been uh, deprioritized or, or outright censored, right, for you, and you've only gotten one thing, that's indoctrination. That's what mm. religion is. You start teaching kids at a very young age. The reason it's dying out is because kids have access to the internet. They didn't at that time. We've all, And a lot of us have been through it. I don't know how old you are. You look like a very young guy. but uh, 30. Um, oh, you are a very young guy. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, you know, I'm 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 gonna be 46. Like by the time this comes out, I'll be 46. So <laughs> <Fair>. <laughs> let's put it that way. Uh, and when I was going, when I was in school, we were all homophobic. Yeah. Same. Well, same. Honestly, same. Uh, yeah, that's probably something that you you guys yeah. had too, right? Like the. Yeah. I'm not gonna say it here because I don't want you to get a strike in case this is on YouTube. But like yeah. the, the F word, yeah. right? the slur for for gay people. I mean, this is something that until a few years ago. 
people used to call each other all the time. And when we were kids, it was as common as calling anybody an asshole or you know anything, just regular. Oh yeah. Stuff. Yeah. That, that is a generation that you and I share a generational mm-hmm. behavior that you and I share. And I, I face, um, anytime I see contestant on the bachelor, in 2011 they dig up old tweets 2011 they d- yeah. drop that word or another in some particularly terrible context or you dig up enough of my tweets 2010 2009 you're, you're, you're talking about me at 17 18 years old that yeah it before before mom was on facebook type era uh-huh. really yeah. early we were getting dark i'm sure i tried to delete a lot of that stuff but that still exists and that was getting thrown around aggressively yeah, yeah. i mean that was uh fortunately we didn't have the uh, <laughs> this, is, this is another way in which i'm more privileged than you will <laughs> is that uh yeah we, we didn't have that sort of documentation in real time that just yeah. exists in the ether forever um but we had, uh, you know, it was it was rampant, and it was very there was very very aggressive. Uh, people had very aggressive sort of antipathy uh, towards gay people. Yeah. They were looked at as the same as you'd look at someone engaged in incest or yeah. pedophilia. I mean, that's how it was looked at, yeah. and it's not just where I was growing up. It was it was like that here too. It was like yeah. that in the U.S. Yeah. Um, so why were we like that? Why were we homophobic? We had to unlearn it. Mm-hmm. You know, we went and we unlearned it. You know, we saw the, the culture change. You know, movie Philadelphia came out. Yeah. People started coming out and talking about these things. We met gay people in our lives. People in our families and among our friends came out of the closet. Uh, the politics of it changed. There are many factors that led us to put that mm-hmm. stuff behind us. But mm-hmm. we were indoctrinated in a certain way. Um and I, I look at that, I think about that a lot when I see how people, uh, when they judge each other now. Now, here's here's the thing. When you're, you can empathize, you can empathize, you can empathize and at the same time denounce people's choices, yeah. right? If you have somebody like, it'd be great to, there's a documentary on Netflix called Hitler, A Career. It's one of my favorite documentaries from 1977. Mm. It kind of puts his atrocities all in the background, which is why it was sort of controversial, but really analyzes how he crafted his speeches, how he built his career, the kind of techniques he used to do to, mm. to, to use to get a crowd going, why he liked the rally, the political rally, because you know, once you once you can get people to feel something, they don't think anymore. And once mm. they start chanting slogans, their brains turn off. And then you can really deliver any message. You know, if you use the emotional appeal method, you do that cognitive empathy. You're familiar with cognitive yeah, empathy, or yeah, where yeah. you're, it's not necessarily compassionate. It's like a lot of people who are psychopathic, a lot of dark triad people yeah. uh, will use. They're able to really pick up on the basest feelings of the populace and then use it to manipulate them, right? right? Uh, and that's your narcissism, psychopathy, Machiavellianism, that's a dark triad. So a lot of demagogues um, do do have that, do share that. So, um, yeah, I, I think, I don't know what we were getting at before, I lost my train of thought, but uh, I, I think that, yes, empathizing with people like that, uh, it goes to a certain extent, you can empathize with them, you can understand that this may not be a function of their will, but a function of their capacity. Mm. Right, they may not. Then the same thing goes for the, in the other direction. If there's some people who are just, they're the, the victims. They're the ones at the rallies who are sloganeering. Right. Um, it, the people are not born with the same kind of capacity to process things. I mean, and I, I was going to give you this example before, and this is going to sound extremely condescending, but I, and I don't mean it to. Yeah. I'm just using it to give an example. But everybody has something to offer. If you have a class full of kids with Down syndrome, you can't get frustrated and angry at them for not being able to grasp calculus. Right. Right? You can, you may be able to appreciate things about them that you struggle with, like showing vulnerability, being affectionate, being right. open with their positive emotions, you know, being happy and smiling all the time. Like those are things that I find hard to do on a daily basis, but, but kids like that do it all the time. And when you're around them, 
they make you feel very, very warm because of it. And, and that's a whole other aspect of humanity that we should appreciate. So not everybody has everything. And my, my whole idea is like, if we're talking about something in public and there's a public discourse, you should state your opinion as clearly as it is. And I don't think you should worry about um, tone or anything like that. But when you're talking one-on-one -on -one to people, and I, I have Trump supporters in my family, just like I have a religious clerics in my family and atheist math professors in my family. And, and when I talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, it's a very different conversation than I would have in, in public, yeah. right? But often the conversations I'll have in public will be something that will trigger them to come and talk to me, which is great. Well, it gets, yeah. I mean, that is what you're doing, working, right? Right. Yeah. Triggering somebody into a conversation, believing it, it, starting to think or disagree with you. Disagreement and sort of visceral frustration with what you're saying is the first step to changing your mind. That's really. yeah, that's what people don't understand. Like if you talk this way, you know, in public, if you tweet like this, then what is it what's it doing? You're not gonna change minds with that. And at my experience in the last twelve years I've been doing this well, like especially with mm. uh, the religious criticism, Islamic criticism is the opposite. It's the first thing that gets them to think they'll get angry, they'll get defensive, and then they'll write to you two years later and say, It's me, I blocked you, or you blocked me, or whatever, you know, from yeah. whatever social media channel, you know, a couple of years ago. Uh, but you know, now I'd like to talk to you about things. I, I can't tell you how many times you get that kind of communication. You talk to anybody who's doing this kind of work and you'll, you'll see that like mm -hmm. it, it's, and it's, it like, it's like that generally has been like that throughout history. And Susan B. Anthony came out and she was talking about women being able to vote. The vast majority of the population was against her. They hated mm -hmm. her. I mean, Harvey Milk got killed for saying that gay people should have rights and Martin Luther King, I, like there were people, Gandhi, like these are people who were assassinated because of the way that they thought about things because they had mass, everything starts with mass opposition to you. Any kind of new transformational idea, all of all revolutions have started off as rebellions, yeah. usually by like one or two or a few, a small group of people who have been relentlessly attacked. And imagine if they had Twitter then, you know, Gandhi said something controversial or I, <laughs> Harvey Milk came out and then everyone's like, oh, no, this is terrible. You know, I can't believe you're saying this. And Because at that time, everybody would pile on him. And then he'd have to say, you know, I'm a this is not what I meant. You're taking it very literally, you know, hashtag just saying. I, I don't know what they did. Like, you wouldn't have had that. Kind of, <laughs> it's just, yeah, people have to be comfortable with, if they, they have to be comfortable with believing what you say and just letting the opposition come and letting the conversation happen and letting mm. it sort itself out. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a big difference between now and back then. Yeah. Do you, so I'm, I'm thinking about that part of the conversation, especially in, in the context of historical figures existing on Twitter and <laughs> other places, yeah. but, uh, the part of the conversation we were talking about 2010, our relationship with that word being in a different place. Um, mm -hmm. The gay slur, right? The, the gay slur. And struggling with the idea of forgiveness moving forward and changing minds publicly, changing your own mind publicly, coming mm -hmm. coming into disagreement, right? So I'm I'm right now in the early phases of what is becoming a public presence. Mm -hmm. And I hope that at least some piece of what I believe today to be true, even if it's not something I've confronted about myself in any, in any regular interval, um, I hope some piece of what I believe is different in two years from now and six months from now and 10 years yeah. from now than, than today. Right. That's progress. That's what growing as a human is. Yeah. Um, and, it, let's say I let's say something in this conversation that I said is some is one of those things that I disagree with in several years from now, and it's found. Mm -hmm. I, nothing about our current structure allows me to eloquently say, "Yeah, I changed my mind." <laughs> yeah, and so. and have people really believe you? Yeah, but you know what? You know that's what I'm talking about. That's if you go into your Twitter at mentions, then you're right. Like it's yeah. if you let that get to you. But 
the, the, this is the really important thing in life. And I, I tell this to everybody. I'm going to tell my daughter this. Yeah. You, you can't give a fuck what people think. <laughs> you just can't do that. There's no, no change in history would ever have happened ever if the people who had these initial ideas were afraid of getting canceled or they give a fuck what people thought. You can't do that because if you do that, then any new idea is going to have mass opposition. You're going to get shut down. I mean, you, you, you have, I, I know there are issues with cancel culture and I, I agree with it. I've talked about it a lot. I think it's ridiculous yeah. that people losing their jobs because of something they tweeted. It's, it's right. terrible. It shouldn't happen. Uh, but for you, if you're starting out as a public presence, yeah. just you just have to accept that part of if you're getting into, uh, and and I, I'll tell you, there's a lot of public figures who pride themselves. And I, you know, okay, so I'm not going to name names, but um, they they pride themselves on saying it like it is. Yeah. And most people I've noticed, the vast majority of people say, "Hey, I just say it like it is," and they talk about how blunt they are with pride. Can never take that in return. Like they, they're very, it's very difficult for them to take criticism, but they love doling it out. Um, so if you're getting into these areas where there are these fraught topics and yeah. these controversial topics, and you want to change the conversation, you want to introduce new ideas, and you're worried about how people will receive them in the yeah. immediate term, yeah. and by immediate we mean more immediate than ever in history, right? Yeah. Like within seconds, uh, you just can't, you, you can't let that get to you. Yeah. Like and apologize when you're wrong. You gotta have some credibility, yeah. right? If yeah. you're wrong about something, or you know, there's a fake news image going around. You shared it and said, "I'm really outraged about this," and it turns out that it was something from years ago. And it's because that happens nowadays yeah. too. Yeah, they post it up and say, "I've done that before." Like yeah. I apologize. I should look into this next time. We look into it. Next time, look into it. Learn yeah. from it. But if there's something that you're not um, apologetic for, that was genuine. I, I, I don't bother explaining it. Don't just let the conversation happen. Let people yeah. talk about it. Let people fight it out, and and discuss the idea. And long term, it almost always pays off. Right, Ali. Where uh, where can folks find you? Where should they find you? <laughs> oh, um, yeah, they can find me. This is I, I find this such a douchey phrase, but yeah, you just you can Google me. Where where can people get pissed off by you? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's uh yeah, I'm on all the usual yeah. things. You can go online. I mean, I have the book, uh, I have the podcast. I mean, those are two main things I'm doing uh, right now. I'm working. Uh, I've I've started moving towards fiction because I find mm. that's another conversation. I find storytelling in fiction a lot more powerful than than nonfiction in terms of. Like getting ideas across. Uh, this has been this has been a blast. Thank you so yeah, much for being fun. here. Yeah, it was fun. It was cool. Yeah. Listen, I really like the project. I love what you're doing with this. Uh, I I like the idea of using travel as a way to uh, really uncover what people are like. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know? uh, it's a lot of fun to do. I've had some wickedly cool conversations, and then the the storytelling piece on itself, fun too. Just making these the rest of the podcast these weird little immersive stories that are sound design it's it's those are so much fun to make there it's, yeah. it's a blast and i'm i'm loving it so i'm looking forward to hearing it like a lot yeah. of the other stuff i heard some of the stuff that you had but i'm looking forward to how you the the, the guests that you especially like you know chloe and bridget fetacy and yeah. you know, some of the other yeah. people that bridget's uh at the time of us recording bridget's is out that one came out last week i'll, I'll shoot that over to oh but, yeah i haven't heard yeah, it yet but yeah. i'll check She's, it out uh, she is a character within <laughs> t the 90 seconds in that episode. She's like in all sorts of crazy situations, drugged out in Sri Lanka, like absolutely insane. <laughs> so she's, she's wild. Um, but yeah, anyway, thank, thank you for being here. This is a blast. Yeah, thanks, man. Sorry to, yeah, it's, it's gotten late, but uh, I think we're both night owls. So we, we both very much are. We both very much are. <laughs> Hey there, my name is Will Conway, and by my measure, you just listen to my voice for an hour and 24 minutes and counting. So you're kind of weird. Um, I appreciate you being here. It means the world. Uh, please subscribe, follow, and upvote this video if you enjoyed it. Uh, subscribing is also going to get you access to all the other videos I've done. I've done some unbelievable conversations with wonderful people. But Baggage Claim is about travel stories no one tells. 
it started with these really highly immersive sound design stories I told from my own uh, travel experiences. Those started to catch on. If you enjoy those, uh, check them out. There are a few here on YouTube, but they're mostly over on the RSS feed. So Apple, uh, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts, you can find those too. And I also have some unbelievable conversations coming up. I mean the world if you check them out. I really think you'll enjoy it. Please subscribe. It's an honor and a privilege to have you here. So enjoy. See you around.